Let's talk about IT service delivery management. Let's talk a little bit about service level management and operations management, uh, change and release and configuration management, incident management, and just generally the IT service level functions. When we take a look here, service level management basically says that we're going to agree upon a certain level of service and we're going to manage that to make sure that we're delivering on that certain level of service. The service level could be from within your own department or it could be from an external provider. Taking a look at the different kinds of providers, obviously we have ISP providers. So we have providers that give us access to the internet and that can be either through business DSL, a dedicated link of some kind like a dedicated T1 or um, some other kind of uh, connectivity. Another is an application service provider. This could be uh, a third-party organization that manages your customer relations database, your electronic health record system, uh, your email system. You just decided that you don't have the staff or the expertise to manage that kind of thing in-house, so you've outsourced it to a third-party provider. Another possibility is a managed service provider, and this could be um, like uh, it would be infrastructure type services like uh, your, your backups or um, <clears throat> maybe software support or if this is non-IT it could be things like um, water and power. Another one is your telecommunications provider which may or may not be the same as your internet service provider. And so your, your telecom would be the folks who uh, handle um, your actual phone systems coming in. Realize that with some of these like especially with the phones, their uh, responsibility might end at a certain point. Like especially with phone providers, there is a point of demarcation, what we call a demark, which is actually a physical box where the line comes in from the outside. And with many service providers, unless you pay for a special contract, their responsibility ends at that demark and your responsibility begins from that point. And that's usually in the phone room, like maybe in the basement or, or um, some equipment room. And sometimes you might have a telecom provider bring you service, but you might have another provider like um, a cabling contractor actually cable all of the um, offices from that DMARC. All of these, though, require certain levels of service that you have to manage and be on top of. Some of the tools that you might use, and we can see here, that we might have reports like exception reports. So these are... Um, things that are generated because a task didn't complete properly or it didn't uh, complete successfully. And so as a task tries to run, an exception report is generated, should be generated automatically. One thing is if you have too many exception reports, then you might have to wonder, okay, is there something wrong with the infrastructure? Is there something wrong with maybe the application? It wasn't written very well. Or um, there's some other kind of issue, and so we need to look into it. You can probably ex expect exception reports occasionally. But if you get too many now, you have to see why that is. You might also have a job rerun report. If you have a, an environment where you run large amounts of transactions at night. And maybe you just batch a bunch of jobs. So income all of these transactions and you're going to then batch them to be processed, put into the database or, or processed in some way. Then um, you may have reports that say, okay, the job failed and we're going to rerun it again. Uh, the job uh, had to restart, the application had to restart. And so we're going to rerun that job again. Another one we can see is an operator problem report. Now a computer operator in a larger environment is somebody who is actually going to be feeding input into the computer and uh, managing the computer. This, this will be like a, a large mainframe um, as opposed to like somebody's desktop. And so that person may uh, give you service or g may give you reports as well. And those will be manual and you have to determine, okay, what's going on here? Maybe you need to train the operator more or maybe there's some other issue that you need to investigate. We can also have output distribution reports. We can see here that, um, and it can be manual or automated, maybe we have uh, a whole bunch of reports and these need to be uh, disseminated. So if we are wondering what uh, has happened to certain reports, the output, output distribution report can say, well, okay, um, 
I sent out all of these reports or I didn't. And it, like I said, it could be a manual or automated task. And then you'll wonder, why wasn't I getting these reports here? Like um, on one EHR project uh, I was working on, all output distribution reports, they were done manually because we didn't have an automated process. And we had to investigate why from one particular uh, facility, we, and actually one particular district, we weren't hearing anything at all. You can also have console logs. Now, if you've ever looked at, say, the log of a firewall or the log of uh, a system, like a, an event viewer log, um, if you've ever looked at a Windows event viewer log, there's tons and tons and tons of stuff that gets outputted to this log because every, every event, every time something opens, something closes, something is done, that's logged. And every time something doesn't work. And you'll have to probably, because the, the output is so extensive, you usually need to have some kind of filter or some kind of application or the logging tool itself to help you narrow down, either search for exactly what you want or just narrow down, I only want to see the criticals or the errors or I only want to see things from last night. So um, console re output is really good, but usually the logging is so extensive that you'll need to find ways to narrow it down and search for only specific things like with Microsoft Windows, um, it was only in the last couple of years that uh, actually there were tools that could really effectively search through and find and track uh, certain things because there was so much raw output. I mean, yes, you could, you could filter to criticals and, and um, errors, but uh, if you wanted to find something that was beyond that, that was maybe a little bit more meaningful uh, and helped you interpret, um, only recently have we seen tools to help us with that. And then also, of course, we can look at operator work schedules. Maybe we are overutilizing users. Maybe uh, we have gaps. Um, maybe you know, during the third shift, uh, maybe there are more transactions that are going to be coming in, and we need to build up our staffing. The input and output control personnel. This is a group of folks. They're responsible for making sure that um, all the processing of the information actually does what we want it to do, that it aligns with the organization's goals. And they will manage the input and the output, both the automatic in, uh, input and the manual input. Remember how we had talked about the idea of automatic input, and we can have sensors automatically feeding input into um, our system and um, being collected. Or people can be manually entering data. So these folks are responsible to make sure that this input is being processed the way the organization needs it to be. Now some of the tasks, the control tasks for input and output, these would include processing input, producing output that we want, and that output is typically going to be in the form of reports and reports that are usable, and reports that are usable for the type of um, a user. So like uh, a, a high-level manager is going to want to see summaries and uh, quick dashboards of of, um, in general, how are certain projects coming along? Or, or in general, how is the whole company doing? Or in general, what are our sales? Whereas um, maybe someone a little bit lower down will want to drill down a little bit more and see, okay, individual tasks or individual users or individual projects, how are they doing? What are the performance metrics of those? And um, the other control tasks will want to make sure that the right people get these reports and these outputs distributed to them, and um, because it's very often that we don't get what we need. I, I hear directors often moan, or and project managers often moan, I, I don't, I'm not getting the input that I need. And so we want to make sure that that input, or the, the, um, the reports, the output, gets to them. We can also uh, be concerned with making sure that the files are used and stored and managed properly. Um, so uh, we've got databases, we've got um, report files, make sure that those are managed properly, as well as incoming uh, data and the files associated with them are also uh, managed properly during processing. So like for example, a really simple example of that would be um, when I was in Africa, we had to manually collect input for our database because there wasn't the telecom system to send it like over the internet and we didn't have dedicated links. So people actually had to drive with flash drives and collect flash drives. And just simple management of that and making sure the flash drives weren't infected and that they were marked. We knew they were where they came from and, and what the date was and on that. 
So that's even a simple example of managing files. We also need to make sure that when we're controlling input and output that the operators themselves are doing what they're supposed to be doing. And, you know, I can't stress that enough because when you're busy working like here and you don't know exactly what folks are doing when, in inputting data here, you need to go and check that. I mean, down at where uh, in one particular um, application I was working on, uh, the folks at the clinic level, they didn't have quite enough training or they had staff turnover. They didn't know how to do, how to input the data properly. And so you have to be on top of that. You have to have controls and mitigating. For us, it was us staying on top of it and training those folks and having someone on staff who could always help and mentor their uh, peers. And then, of course, you need to make sure that the information maintains its integrity, that it's not changed or damaged or corrupt in any way, that uh, it's, it, it still stays um, as it should be, that it's not modified in any sort of unauthorized manner. Another thing, of course, we have to worry about is scheduling. We've got to make sure that the jobs run correctly. They run in sequence. That if one job fails, is it okay for another job to run? So that is another thing we need to be concerned about. And, of course, scheduling can be automated. It can be manual. Hopefully you automate tasks. But, again, if you automate tasks, you've got to stay on top of the output and the reports of those automated tasks to make sure they were actually done. Um, I mean, recall the story of... Yeah, we had backups and, and they ran every night, but nobody bothered to actually check to make sure the job's actually completed properly. So these are all things that when you are doing, um, uh, when you're managing input and output and you're man looking at the controls that you have to take a look at. And the IS auditor has to make sure that from the input, the processing, the output, and the distribution, all of that is, um, there's no break and it's all accounted for and done properly.